The secret criminal history of rock and roll stretches all the way back to its birth. And one man who saw an opportunity to cash in any way he could, you may not recognize his name, but his influence is everywhere. Marsh Levy was kind of a rock and roll godfather. Yeah, that, that's, that'd be an appropriate term. He was the mob's guy in the music business. Morris Levy couldn't sing or play an instrument, but he became a rock and roll player. He got it. He started grabbing up the rights to its most important product, the music. He cut out the artists and invited in the mob. He was a new kind of businessman. He was economically powerful. He made a lot of money in, in the record business uh, early on. William Nadelsader covered the music business, the mob, and Morris Levy for the Los Angeles Times. He was able to get things done and, and uh, that other people couldn't get done because of the, the fear of the guys in the background, the guys in the dark suits. Morris Levy's associations with the mob went back to when he was a kid. <laughs> the street kid from the Bronx got into the music business in the 1940s, running New York City jazz clubs. In 1949, he opened up the most legendary jazz club of all, Birdland on West 52nd Street. He met all the guys who owned the clubs who were wise guys. And uh, that's where the talent played. So when the record business came along as a big business, it wasn't a big step to represent talent and start up a record company. Morris Levy started his record company in 1956. He named it Roulette. And he gambled that it would cash in on the new craze called rock and roll. They had a big long string of success with, with Jimmy Rogers and, and Tommy James and the Shondells and Joey D and the Starlighters and Frankie Lyman and the Teenagers. And Morris sort of used that as his base to expand into other areas of, of, of the music business, into all areas. Morris Levy was in a very astute businessman in terms of the value of music publishing and sound recordings. Stan Sucher wrote about Morris Levy in his book, They Fought the Law. He was one of the first to be so highly aggressive in securing as many uh, song copyrights as he could. Back in the early days of rock and roll, most people thought that this was a flash in the pan. Morris Levy could be called to some extent a visionary. But there was one problem in the way Morris Levy often took ownership of these songs. He didn't write them. He simply put his name to them and took the royalties. They were worth millions. Yeah, he was, a, he was supposedly the co-author of the famous Frankie Lyman hit, uh, Why Do Fools Fall In Love? And collected a royalty as a, as a songwriter, the co-writer on that song. Well, he didn't write that song. He just was powerful enough and scary enough to say, I wrote that song, you know, and they put his name down. Kenny Laguna was there. He recorded for Roulette in the 1960s with groups like Tommy James and the Shondells. I wouldn't say you could say Morris muscled in. I think he had a three-year-old daughter that wrote more songs than Cole Porter, but if you wanted to play in Morris's ballpark, you had to play with Morris's rules. Chuck Rubin managed some of the artists Morris ripped off, including Frankie Lyman himself. If uh, his artists would come to him and say, uh, you know, where are our royalties? You know, what about our royalties? He says, if you want royalties, go visit the Queen. I can't pay you because I'll have to pay everybody. Everybody listening here! The rock and roll is here. Morris Levy also managed the most influential rock and roll DJ of the 50s. Alan Freed came out of Cleveland and spread the beat across America. He actually coined the term rock and roll. Morris Levy then trademarked the phrase and tried to charge people money for using it. And when Alan Freed broke the law and took payola, money from record companies to play their records, Morris Levy took a cut. In all the FBI documents, um, they suspected that, uh, that Morris Levy was behind the whole payola scandal of the 50s that involved Alan Freed. Payola? Yes. It definitely exists today. But it's not a sense of like, hey, give me a hundred bucks, I'll play your record. It's, very, it's a little bit more subtle now. By the 1970s, Roulette Records' influence had faded. But Morris Levy's influence was everywhere. He owned publishing companies, the Strawberry Records store chain. He was even powerful enough to take on the Beatles. In the spring of 1970, Levy sued the Beatles for copyright infringement. 
It seems the song Come Together sounded too similar to a Chuck Berry song he owned. The lawsuit led John Lennon to make a settlement offer in 1973. John Lennon agreed to record an album of old rock and roll songs to which Morris Levy owned the music publishing rights. Again, Morris Levy stood to make millions. But when John Lennon didn't finish the rock and roll album quickly enough, Levy got hold of the unfinished tapes and released them as a mail-order album, available only through his record company. That forced John Lennon to hurry up to try to get his release in the record stores. The dispute went to trial after all in 1976. Lennon and Levy sued each other. The ex-Beatle claimed Levy's unfinished product cost him album sales and reputation. Rock critic Dave Marsh was called as an expert to show that Morris Levy's product was inferior to a legitimate John Lennon album. I testified and said, you know, this and that about the records and that this was supposed to be a lot of baritone saxes, which you could tell on the Lennon recording, but it just sounded like a big ball of fuzz on the Levy version. And the judge stops me and says, well, there is no comparison between these two records. Levy's lawyer and Levy are sitting there and they're looking like it's time to go out and buy some underalls, boys, because you just got kicked in the face by the judge, and this is a judge trial, not a jury trial. The judge ruled in John Lennon's favor. By the 1980s, Morris Levy's music empire was worth $85 million. He was also a target of the FBI investigating mob influence in the record industry and his own ties to the godfather of the Genovese crime family. Morris was very, very close with Vincent the Ch Giganti in, in his later years. Bill Nadelsader was on the story when Morris Levy was brought down by his friendship with the Chin and their business of selling overstocked records. He was partnered with the Genovese family and they would buy all the old, unwanted records from the major companies and they would sell them you know, another place, another way. There's hundreds of millions of them sold every year, so it adds up to a lot of money. The old records were known as cutouts, the ones that show up in record store bargain bins. In 1986, Morris Levy made a deal to sell four million of these records to a good fella in Philadelphia. When the man refused to pay, Levy once again handled things in his own special way. <coughs> Simple extortion, lost a temper and punched him out. Uh, probably happens every day, except that in this case, the FBI was following him. On September the 22nd, 1986, Morris Levy was arrested for a common street crime. They probably wanted Morris to roll over on Vincent the Chin Gigante. Uh, Morris was not going to do that because he'd be a dead man. I said I, I wouldn't join the witness protection program. Why not? Two reasons. One is I don't, I don't believe in the entire thing as being constitutional. And the other one is, there's nothing I could tell him about a mob. In 1988, Morris Levy was convicted of extortion and sentenced to 10 years in prison. While he was appealing the sentence, he was diagnosed with cancer. He died uh, before he ever got, got to see the inside of a prison. So, I guess he evaded. <laughs> Possibly. Morris Levy was gone, but his influence remained as you'll see, into the 21st century. Still ahead, violence, crime, and rap. The more things change, the more they stay the same. There's no such thing as gangster rap. What the term should have been was reality rap.